Okay gang, take a little sigh of relief. You made it through carbon nails, and that's not an easy thing to do. Well, don't let your guard down yet though, because if carbon nails is, in my opinion, the mo the, some of the more difficult material in Ochem 2, this is probably right behind it as far as difficulty goes. But rest assured, after this, things get much simpler. This is definitely the hardest stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of not focus so much on the carbonyl like we did in the last unit of material, but now we're gonna kind of focus on what's called the alpha carbon. And what is that exactly? Well, if I have some generic carbonyl, let's just say this is an R group over here, and let's just call this R prime, this could be the same, could be different. Here's what the alpha carbon is. Directly off of the carbonyl, this is what you would call the alpha position, right? And actually, let me just extend this just a little bit. If you want to kind of, the way we kind of name the carbons off of the carbonyl is that directly to the right or left, that is the alpha position. Then the carbonyl after that would be the beta carbon. This would be the gamma carbon. So kind of just like a little bit of a, a Greek alphabet lesson. But anyways, we're not really focused on the beta or the gamma carbons. We're really just focused on the alpha carbon. And there's, there's a couple reasons why. For one, the beta and gamma carbon are not nearly as interesting as the alpha carbon. And let me just give you a quick crash course as to why. Okay, so let's just look if we draw a hydrogen, right? We would refer to this hydrogen as an alpha hydrogen, or if it's taken off in an acid base reaction, which is gonna happen a lot, we would call this an alpha proton. Okay. So if we looked at pKa values, or if we just think about acidity in a kind of uh, qualitative type of, of way, this is a pretty acidic proton if we look at it, right? Here's a couple reasons why. Let's just say I have some generic base. Let's just, uh, if I use T-butoxide, right? We'll throw back to our favorite elimination base, besides LDA. If I were to grab that hydrogen, this proton, right? And I swung these electrons, you know, I, I have a couple options, right? I could dump these electrons onto this carbon, right? So what would that look like? If I kind of drew my arrow downward, here's the reason why the alpha carbon is kind of a cool thing, right? Is this a stable conjugate base? AKA, did we come from a somewhat stronger acid? Well, think about our five rules. Which one applies here? Definitely resonance as far as our five acid base rules go, right? Because what I can do here is I can kind of swing these electrons up here, and then I can kick these electrons up onto the carbonyl oxygen. He's electronegative, he likes electron density. That's a good thing. So I could have something like this, right? You can see that resonance stabilizes our conjugate base. So the alpha proton is acidic, right? There's some kind of stabilizing effect after any acid base reaction. Okay. So let me just show you something else because there's a couple of functional group names that we can introduce. So let's look in a basic environment. Let's just take a simple carbonyl. Let's just take acetone, right? And let's just say I introduce some T-butoxide, right? Let's just say I'm going to take off this alpha proton, right? Because there's plenty right here. There's three alpha protons to be exact. Let's just say I take this H off of TV tox, or the TV toxide grabs that proton, it abstracts that proton. And then let's just say I go straight for the resonance right off the bat. Let's take these electrons, I'll swing them up to here to form this carbon-carbon double bond. And when I do that, I need to swing these electrons up onto the carbonyl oxygen, right? So if I do that electron flow, we get this type of final product, if you want to call it that. Right? In a basic environment, T-butoxide takes this proton, electrons swing up, electrons go up on oxygen, and then we have a negative charge. And if you kind of want to look at this generic shape, right, because we could extend the carbon chain any which way we want to, this is what's called, and we're going to use these a lot, this is what is called an enolate, okay? An enolate. We'll be using these as nucleophiles a bunch this unit, okay? Now on the other hand, and you, this will definitely look familiar, or hopefully it would look familiar to you guys. If not, that's okay. We're going to go over it right now. Let's just say we have an acidic environment, and we have the same carbonyl. Well, remember, 
this electronegative oxygen likes to get protonated pretty easily. So I'm just going to assume he's picked up some form of H plus at some point. So this carbonyl oxygen has a positive charge. Well, let's do the same exact thing, right? Instead of TV toxide, because we don't have those types of negative charges in acidic environments, let's just say water is floating around and he just kind of moseys on over and grabs this proton, right? Well then, we would swing these electrons up to form this carbon-carbon double bond, right? And we can't break the octet rule, so I'm gonna kick these electrons up to the carbonyl, carbonyl oxygen, effectively getting rid of this positive charge, and we end up with this functional group. And if you kind of remember this from the tail end of OCHEM 1, especially here on JOCHEM, maybe in your class that you took for Organic Chemistry 1, this is called an enol. Okay, so you can see that these are almost the same functional group, right? This is just the basic environment form of an enol, and the enol, or an enolate is that, and an enol is just the protonated form of an enolate. Okay, so you're going to see that we're going to use these guys as nucleophiles to kind of do a whole bunch of really cool reactions, and they're really kind of like the big building block reactions in organic chemistry too. Okay, so this process of deprotonating the alpha carbon right here, if you want to give it a name that's pretty self-explanatory, that's called alpha deprotonation. And to close out this video, I'm just going to erase this all, and we're going to talk about this and when you can kind of do it and when someone might trip you up and when you can't do it. Okay? So give me one quick sec. Okay, gang. So before we call it quits on this video, I just want to go over two examples of things that could possibly go wrong with alpha deprotonation. All right? These are more of like someone's going to give you a problem on an exam and say, oh, given this environment, alpha deprotonation doesn't occur. Why is that the case? Please explain. And then you're going to be like, oh, like, oh, I got this. I know how to explain it. Okay, so here are the two conditions you must meet for alpha deprotonation. First of all, you have to have an alpha proton. So here's an example of where that could possibly come up short. Let's just say we have something like an aldehyde, right? So the only way we could deprotonate, the only alpha carbon we have would be right here, right? Because there is no, this hydrogen is attached to the carbonyl carbon, right? Well. What if I tack on these two methyl groups right here, right? Well, let's just say we had some basic environment and our base wanted to come in to form an enolate, right? Because enolates form in basic environments. Well, we couldn't do it because these are two methyl groups here. This base would have no alpha carbon to grab an alpha proton off of, right? So we would not, this would be the enolate we would want to form. But first of all, this breaks the octet rule, and there is no alpha hydrogen, no alpha proton to grab. So you need to make sure that one, you actually do have an alpha proton instead of, you know, something that's attached to other alkyl pieces and has a full octet. Okay, that's the first shortcoming. Now here's the next one. This is a little sneakier, so this is one that definitely people might try and trip you up on. I have this on a worksheet for you guys but I just want to go over it together because I think it's one of those things where once you see it, you get it, but you kind of need to see it first. Okay, so let's just say we had, let me think for a second. Okay, here we go. What it's say if we had this cyclic structure right here, this is a methyl group, and we had almost the same exact cyclic structure this might be the exact problem on your worksheet, but I want to make sure you guys see it explained by me. Let's just say we see this type, these two types of structures, almost the same, right? Only differing by this stereo center, right? This just inverted stereochemistry right here. We have two enantiomers, right? So let's just say I throw in some hydroxide, some base, right? Just something to pick off an alpha proton. Well, do we in fact have one? And yes, we do, right? Here, it takes the form of a dash, and here, it would take the form of a wedge. Well, what if I told you guys that this structure, you actually obtain an enolate, because we are in a basic environment, so we form enolates, not enols, 
So let's just say we form this enolate in this situation, but here we have no reaction. We don't even form one. Why would that be the case? And a little throwback because we're going to have to draw some chairs. But here I'm going to explain the concept first. When you deprotonate with an alpha deprotonation, you have to make sure that those resulting electrons kind of orient themselves parallel to the p orbitals in the carbonyl oxygen and the carbonyl carbon pi bond, right? So if we have p orbitals right here, when these electrons get dumped off onto this carbon, you know, because if we drew the other resonance form, they have to kind of align with these p orbitals. So let me show this to you guys. Let me draw So, if my oxygen is right here, next door to it right here would be my carbonyl, carbon and oxygen, right? That's one, two, three. This would be one, two, down here, all the way down there would be three, right? So my methyl group here is up. And since this is a valley, we have up axial and then down equatorial, or sorry, up equatorial, down axial. So remember my hydrogen is right there. Okay, well remember the chemistry that's happening here. We have an acid base reaction, right? So if I'm going to grab that alpha proton and I'm going to dump these electrons onto the dot carbon right here, right? The electron pair is kind of in an orbital going down, down axial, right? So if I almost want to erase him, draw a little loop, and there's my electrons in my negative charge. Now let me fill in my p orbitals up top on the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. Do you see how they're both going vertical? These two are going up and down, and this electron pair is going straight down. So they are indeed parallel with each other. This forms a three carbon conjugated system, right? Do you see how, that's why we can draw resonance amongst these, uh, these two carbons and this oxygen, is because there's conjugation. And remember, for conjugation, you need to have a system of parallel orbitals that can delocalize electrons through resonance, right? Okay, well let's take a look at this over here. I'll draw the, the chair over, yeah, the chair over here. Same exact chair. Okay, I'm gonna put that oxygen right here. Again, if we number one, two, three, on carbon two, right? Oxygen is number one, carbon two, we have the carbonyl, and then down here, right on carbon three, now we have the methyl group going down axial, and we have our hydrogen going up equatorial. Well, again, if we do the chemistry that we're out here to do, this acid base chemistry, grab the alpha proton, dump the electrons onto the alpha carbon, well, you can see, let me draw the orbital up equatorial. Right, Our orbitals are still going up and down right here. They're kind of like this. But if you look at the lone pair, it's perpendicular, right? Not parallel. So this, these electrons do not participate in the conjugation. Therefore, you can't really get that energetic payoff, right? There's, remember, conjugation stabilizing. But that's not going on here. That's why there's no reaction. That's why you don't deprotonate the alpha carbon. You don't take that alpha proton. However, here because you're dumping those electrons into an orbital that will conjugate with the carbonyl carbon and carbonyl oxygen, that's good to go. Okay, sorry if that was a lot. In the worksheet, I have you guys make a lot of enolates, a lot of enols. It's kind of a way to ease you in because you are going to have to just be able to look at a structure and kind of imagine, okay, what's the enol? What is the enolate, okay? All right, before you actually go off and do that, in the next video, we're going to talk about how you can form two different types of enolates. So watch the next video, then attack the worksheet, okay?